President Biden has supported repeal of the Hyde Amendment. And so, you know, I will anticipate how that operates in the budget process, but that is a position that he took in the campaign and has held. President Joe Biden's choice to leave the Office of Management and Budget near a Tandon tries to convince senators she will leave partisan politics behind if confirmed. That testimony is from her Senate hearing this week. Tandon, a former advisor to Hillary Clinton and the president of Center for American Progress, has been a harsh critic of Republicans and pro-lifers on social media. She's made the depiction of people of faith as using a cudgel. If confirmed, this will be the third time Tandon has worked in a Democratic administration. Our next guest, the former OMB director, stands in stark contrast to Neera Tandon. While pro-life groups raise alarm over Tandon's role in the OMB, they praised previous OMB director Russell Vogt for being instrumental in stopping Title X taxpayer funding of Planned Parenthood and other abortion businesses and protecting private insurers from being forced to cover elective abortions and in safeguarding conscience protections for pro-life health care workers and entities. Russell Vogt, the former director of the Office of Management and Budget, is here with us. Vogt served as director of OMB for two years. He was a member of President Trump's cabinet and was responsible for overseeing the implementation of the president's policy, management, and deregulatory agendas across the executive branch. Russ, welcome. Uh, first, what is your reaction to Neera Tandon's nomination as the next OMB director? Yeah, it is very consistent with all of the hard left uh, nominees that this president has put forward. Uh, she will be in a position, if confirmed, to be able to ensure that his policies are reflected throughout the federal government. Really, that is the role of the Office of Management and Budget. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she is something. She is someone that uh, is consistent with his leftist agenda. I mean, he has tried to, um, I think, govern with a tone of, of moderation. But if you look within the policies, they are they're just as hard left as we expected. So, um, you know, she's going through the process that I went through. Uh, not the most comfortable process, uh, but it is it is certainly one f that should trouble pro-lifers from the standpoint of the policy agenda that she'll be asked to to uh, mm -hmm. articulate. I'd love to speak more to that. It may not seem very obvious that the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, does play a crucial role when it comes to the abortion issue at the executive level. For those of us who have never worked in the White House, uh, can you break down the importance of that specific mm -hmm. office, the office you directed, and why pro-lifers need to pay attention to what happens there? Yeah, OMB directors get uh, the title of budget director, mm -hmm. but really the Office of Management Budget is designed to execute a president's agenda throughout the federal government. So every regulation goes through the Office of Management Budget, all resource decisions. So if an uh, administration wants to spend money at the Department of Health and Human Service, that decision will come through the Office mm -hmm. of Management and Budget. And then we also have a lot of opportunity to work on management issues. So you're really a nerve center from the federal government's perspective to be able to put uh, a high-level policy position into effect and to make sure that the bureaucracy, quite frankly, isn't going in a different direction. And so, uh, you know, I think the choice of, of Nira to that position is, is reflective of, of, the, of President Biden wanting someone that's consistent with his ideology to be able to use that, all the authority and power that that office has. Mm. During your time as OMB director, what specific pro-life accomplishments were you able to directly work on and advance? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the beauty of working in the Trump administration is the president had um, a very strong commitment to life. And mm. so we knew, for those of us who were pro-life within the administration, that any decision that got to the Resolute Desk was going to go in a different way. So it really empowered us to be able uh, to push pro-life policies. You know, two that I am, am particular uh, fond of having worked on was uh, the effort to, to bar the co-location of Planned Parenthood facilities to say that if you're going to be in the business of health, then you have to be co differently located than uh, your, your abortion activities. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, money is fungible and there's a reason they wanted to, to group those centers together. And as a result, Planned Parenthood said, we're going to get out of the Title X program. So mm -hmm. that was a major, major uh, reform that we put forward. And the second one, uh, which did ex have a, a quite a bit of debate within the administration, was whether we were going to get out of the business of federal funding of, of uh, field tissue 
research. Mm. And this was something that was particularly of, of importance because, uh, you know, the scientific community was offering up all of the things that could be done uh, with this research. And, you mm -hmm. know, the president came down on the pro-life side uh, once again. And that was something that, uh, you know, we took to the Resolute Desk and, and took to the Oval Office and, and uh, it was a really important uh, policy decision that the president made. Mm. President Joe Biden has been in office for three weeks now, and he's already rescinded the Mexico City policy, and he has directed Health and Human Services to review the Protect Life rule, that rule that you were just describing, which is a sign that's about to be gone as well, likely. How significant is all of this, and what's your reaction as someone who directly worked on those policies? The speed at which he has been moving forward is just amazing in the sense that uh, he is just using executive order after executive order to pull back these. And when it says, you know, we're just reviewing it, what he's doing there is not necessarily saying I'm considering it. He's saying to the American people, I need to go through particular legal processes to make sure that if we move in, a di in that direction, it can sus be sustained in court. And so this is not good news that, you know, it's, it hasn't been done yet. It, it is just merely the fact that we have a battle on our hands. Uh, speaking of HHS, what's your reaction to President Biden's nominee to head the HHS, uh, California Attorney General Xavier Becerra? Very concerned about it. Uh, he was in charge of a very consequential office in, in the state of California. So he not only is hard left in his policies, uh, pro-choice, uh, radical ideologies, but he's also led a very big institution and has been involved in uh, law in, in legal suits that, from a standpoint of knowing how the government works, uh, I think he'll know quite a bit. And so uh, I have substantial concerns about that and how he'll work with the Office of Management and Budget. Can you explain how, in your role as OMB director, how closely you worked with the HHS secretary? What was that relationship like there? You work very closely. You're a member of the cabinet together. Mm -hmm. uh, you're often on the phone with each other trying to work through particular issues. Um, and this was an, an area where, um, you know, I was fortunate to have a good relationship with Alex Azar. Uh, but your o OMB director is, is kind of, you're within the White House complex. And so you're a part of all of those policy discussions, but you're also translating those for the agencies. Mm -hmm. I want to pivot to a new topic now. You are launching the Center for American Restoration and its advocacy arm, American Restoration Action. It's been reported the goal is to keep important cultural issues alive and at the forefront. Tell us about your plans with your new group and is the pro-life issue one you plan to prominently work on? It is, and I, I laid out our vision in an op-ed recently and pro-life was number one mm -hmm. uh, on our list of, of issues. You know, my view is that for too long, the center-right movement has not engaged enough on the cultural issues. Mm -hmm. These are the issues that get you disinvited from a, a dinner party, that causes tension with your neighbors, and yet those are the issues that are the are where we're getting the onslaught the most from the left. And so, our challenge is to be able to restore a consensus in this country about what it means to be American, but to arm people, people grassroots, families, communities, to be able to have these conversations in a way that actually convinces people so that mm -hmm. we can add people to our, our, our ranks. And I think the pro-life movement itself is a model of a movement that over 50 years has been able to take an issue and bring converts to the side so that we are in a much better situation uh, now than we were in the 1970s, although we have tremendous work to do. Right. The pro-life movement's only growing stronger. Henry Olson wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post last week about your new think tank and the need to flesh out ideas that a serious governing movement needs. That being said, would you say the pro-life movement has any sort of equivalent of this? And you've already said it seems it will have an institutional presence at your new group. It will. It'll be in, on the pro-life issue. I think the movement is is great and really developed, and I think we'll just slide in alongside of other great organizations that have, over the last 40 or 50 years, really been able to uh, talk about the the the, mm -hmm. the issue of getting rid of abortion. But we want to take it one step further, you know, and and have a culture of life that is celebrated. 
Uh, you know, I look at it from the standpoint of I have a child with cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm. and we have a fight on our hands within that community because there are so many people in this country that when they get that uh, information from a doctor or a nurse that they're going to have a, a cystic fibrosis baby, they they're, they go to a, a dark place. And, and we want to be a voice for the, for those with conditions like that or uh, the dis individuals with disability that th this is a great place and that they have dignity and they have human worth. And as a result, America is a great place for them as well. Absolutely. We only have about a minute left, but I understand at the Center for American Restoration, you'll also directly address cancel culture. Uh, how much of a threat is cancel culture to the pro-life movement, do you think? Uh, increasingly, it is it is something that I think people are going to be very concerned about in the sense that anytime we engage in these cultural issues in pro-life, I think because of the work of the last 50 years is a little bit more accepted than it once was. Uh, but we still have a fight on our hand with regard to conscience protections. And anytime you're going against culture, culture, the high, the high points of culture is going to be fighting back and trying to minimize our voice. And so uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and that is a particular place that we will focus on. Well, it's an honor to have you here. Russell Vogt, former director of the Office of Management and Budget and president of the Center for American Restoration. Thank you. Thank you. Joining us now on Skype is Mallory Quigley, vice president of communications for the Susan B. Anthony List. Mallory, welcome. First, I'd like to get your reaction to our interview with Russ Vogt. Can you speak to Russ Vogt's leadership and what you think his OMB legacy will be when it comes to the pro-life issue. Yeah, what a fantastic man, um, great pro-life advocate. He, like you said, you know, played a key role in implementing the Trump-Pence Protect Life rule, which had the impact of defunding Planned Parenthood of up to $60 million, drawing that bright line of separation between abortion and family planning. Uh, and he, he helped with conscience protections for pro-life insurers uh, and, and just so many more things. It's a key role. And Russ shares in that Trump-Pence legacy, having set the standard, raised the bar very high for future pro-life administrations in establishing a to-do list of all the things that are just automatic when we have a pro-life White House. Mallory, Neera Tandon is set to take over as the next OMB director pending Senate confirmation. How concerning is this for pro-lifers? Why is that role so consequential? Yeah, well, Russ explained it very well, you know, that this is the the office that is a clearinghouse for the administration's policy priorities because they set the budget. And, uh, you know, when you look at, at his legacy, it really is providing a backwards roadmap mm -hmm. for um, Miss Tandem to reverse all of those things and look for as many slush funds for the abortion industry as she can. This is a, you know, director of Center for American Progress. It's a very uh, pro-abortion uh, liberal group. Planned Parenthood has been her top cheerleader throughout this process. And so this is a concerning appointment from the pro-life perspective, for mm -hmm. sure. We heard Russ Vogt explain the significance of the HHS department as well in advancing pro-life accomplishments. Xavier Becerra is Biden's nominee to be the next HHS secretary. What should we know about Becerra and what's your message to the Senate ahead of his confirmation hearing? Yes, well, uh, Becerra is uh, somehow known, uh, you know, the media is reporting on him as kind of being a moderate guy. He couldn't be anything uh, he, he, he could not be more radical, actually, on, when it comes to abortion policy in particular. Becerra has been around for a long time. He served in Congress. He voted against the partial birth abortion ban and then had a, a record of not just being a passive pro-abortion supporter, but really an active uh, advocator of abortion policy, going after pro-life journalists in uh, in California, David Daleiden, Sandra Merritt, persecuting pro-life pregnancy centers and pro-life insurance companies and schools and churches. So he has a, a radical adv advocacy record on this. And we want our senators to know that Susan B. Anthony List will be keeping grassroots informed about Sarah's record, and we don't want them to vote to confirm him. Mm. Mallory, while I have you real quick, can I get your reaction to news that Elise Hogue, president of NARAL, is stepping down? NARAL is essentially the antithesis to the Susan B. Anthony list. Yeah, it's one of our um, 
one of the groups that we come up against head to head, especially in elections, they've been in decline for the last several years. And I read with great interest the interview she did with the New York Times. I found a lot of the messaging to be contradictory um, and reflective of some of the messaging disagreements we've seen coming from the pro-abortion movement over the last few years, whether or not we're uh, shouting your abortion or this is something that to be you know, treated more delicately. Uh, she did say that the courts are the biggest threat to the pro-abortion movement, and for the first time in decades, that is true, thanks to President Trump and the transformation of the judiciary. We don't know what's next for her, but I do know she has young children at home, and there's always the hope that hearts and minds will be changed. So I'll be praying mm -hmm. for her, and I encourage all the viewers to do so as well. Absolutely. It's interesting news to watch. Mallory Quigley with the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine.